This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. Yes. What What is God to you? I believe God is. You do believe in God, a God. Yes, I do. Yes. What do you believe in? I believe that God is the first source and center of all things and beings, that God is the creator, controller, and infinite upholder of all reality, that God is the universal father. Personal? Personal, yes. That God is Personal as opposed to impersonal. Because if God were the acme of all reality, and if we were then to deny God personality, we would be denying God one large portion of the very highest we know of reality here on earth. In other words, if we were to conceive of a God, infinite, perfect, eternal, and all the rest, and then deny him personality, when we consider that the highest realities we know here on earth are personal realities, love, friendship, fellowship, we would be denying God this and it would be a logical contradiction in itself. Are you keeping, are you keeping God then on a personal level? I mean, might not a stone feel that God is a stone? when in reality God might be something uh, infinitely more than stone. I would say that God may be and indeed is infinitely more than just a personality, but he is at least a personality. By this I mean that God can know and be known, love and be loved, that I can have a sense of interaction, of fellowship, of transaction with God. You can have a relation, you with your your finitude can have a relationship to infinity? How? How do you bridge the gap? Personality is what bridges that gap. Otherwise, spatially and temporally, the infinite, the eternal, one might argue, could not be known by someone who is finite and who is time-bound. But it is by this factor of personality that personalities can know each other. And for this reason, I believe, one of the most important things Jesus said was that God is a father, that God can be known, and that men are children of God. And that word father, used 152 times in the New Testament, depicts a deity who is not abstract, who is not somehow disinterested in man, but who is compassionately concerned and who can know and be known. I think that's important. There's, there's no questioning the fact that most religions picture God as being personal. That in itself doesn't prove anything. Right. And the fact that, that Christ spoke of a personal God just might be part of his milieu is what he grew up in. Uh, I still don't I would further say that I have the experience of God as a personal God. What sort of experience do you have? I mean, you experience God as a person, what does that mean? In the same sense that I'm standing here in this crowd and I experience you as a person, someone with whom I have interaction and a sense of fellowship, or at least we're communicating, in the same way it is possible to have this sort of fellowship and communication with God. What, and what form does the communication take? Obviously you don't talk to each other, not like this, not with, with a sound waves going through air. I don't use the microphone. No. Well, how do you communicate? I mean, how do you know it's not all, all from you outward? Is there any In other words, how does a person know that prayer is not simply a process of bouncing thoughts off the dome of his own cranium and indulging in some sort of auto-suggestion or psychological trickery on himself? Obviously, there's no way of demonstrably proving this with a slide rule or something of this nature. But a person can know this, again, in the same kind of experience that you have in communicating with another person. There's a feel, there's a taste about it. In the same sense that William James one time said, what's the difference between a moral act and an immoral act? The moral act tastes better. I would say this is how it tastes. The experience of it, the feeling of it, is that of a real feeling. And furthermore, it makes a palpable difference in a person's life. When you believe that you're infinitely beloved, in spite of your own imperfections and failings, that you're infinitely valuable and worthwhile to God, it makes a difference in the way you go about your daily life. And that's some sort of evidence in itself. Do you make a, a, a distinction between believing and knowing? What I'm, what I'm suggesting is, do you believe with uh, an aura of doubt, perhaps, these things, as opposed to knowing that you're in Berkeley? You know you're in Berkeley, you don't doubt you're in Berkeley. I would make a bifurcation between belief and faith. That faith is more than belief, and that belief is nothing but intellectual assent. One might nod his head to the proposition that we're standing just south and east of the Student Union building on the Berkeley campus. But it wouldn't make an enormous, life-changing difference in one's style of living. What I'm saying is that faith molds and motivates one's life. And the faith that one is loved by God, a child of God, gives an entirely new impulse and impetus in going out and being able to live with joy, with a sense of peace, and living as a brother or a sister to all the rest of mankind. Did you have any questions? No, I'd like to make a statement, though. Well, you know, when I was real little and I went to Sunday school and everything, they taught me that God was in each and every one of us because He created us.
Well, I kind of like think that they were half right. In other words, I think that not that we're part of, I mean, uh, there's, there's part of God in each and every one of us, but we are all part of God. Because like, um, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, in other words? Well, no, not really. I just think that everybody on this whole world is like God, all in one. And uh, so therefore, when you, when you love God, you're loving yourself, and you first must love yourself before anybody else. And therefore, that makes you God. I believe you made a correct point in saying that in order to love another person, you first have to have a certain self-respect. And many psychiatrists and psychologists have pointed this out, that a person who has no feeling of his own worth and selfhood finds it very difficult to see any worth and selfhood and therefore to respect other human beings as well. Therefore, this is why I was emphasizing the belief, the faith that you as individuals are children of God, that you're valuable regardless of what denomination, sect, or cult you may tend to join or whatever you may sign your name to, whatever membership card. The important thing is a person finding this new sense of his own value as a child of God and then in the context of that he can love other people in a new way because he understands who he is. But why must you be a child of God? Why can't you be God? Why can't you be part of him instead of just a child? That's okay. Part of God? In other words, pantheism as in Hindu philosophy? It's like saying you are God. You, if you're saying that you're a child of God, that's saying that you just, um, like, like you've got a father, and you have no father, you have no mother, you, you're your own creator, your own creator. I would say if we define God as infinite, I do not feel myself to be infinite, therefore I could not say that I am God in that sense. I believe in some sort of life after death. Yes, I do, very strongly. What survives death? I believe man's soul does. What's the soul? I believe the soul <laughs> is the result of the interplay between the spirit of God, which is inside man's mind, and man's mind itself. In other words, the soul is a third thing. It is the real transcript, the identity of the human being. It is the real you, the soul. And it is a priceless thing. As Jesus said one time, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But this is... Are you a Christian? I'm a follower of the teachings of Jesus. Okay. <laughs> What'd you say? I just said good. <laughs> um, oh, well, I was, you, he was saying something about life after death. Can I give my uh, views on that? <laughs> yes, what do you think? Well, n not really. See, I think that you know how um, uh, people all know that there's supposed to be a determining factor whether or not when you die you go to heaven or hell. You know, like. You mean a sort of judgment? Yeah, a judgment. All right. So I think that when the judgment day comes, you either um, you die, and uh, when you're born again, you're either born into a very miserable life, or you're born into something much happier, one way or the other, whichever way it works. Because I don't think the soul ever dies. The body can die, but the soul lives on. So uh, I'm I believe there's only one thing I would add. I would say that if a person has the free choice on this earth here to live or to commit suicide, I think that he also spiritually has the choice to commit cosmic suicide if he wants to. That, in other words, a person would not even have to live eternally. So great is the sovereignty of man's individual free will that he can choose, if he wants, to live eternally in this spiritual realm or not. Because I think nothing is forced upon man against man's will. That God has given man free will, that we are infinitely loved, sons and daughters, all men are children of God. And this is one point I've had a number of people really bring up and sometimes be very, what'd you say? Who is God? Is he God or Jesus or Buddha or Allah or any way you want to look at it? My definition of God is that God is the first source and center of all things and beings, the creator, controller, infinite upholder of all reality, that God is the sovereign, eternal, immortal, invisible being, and he's the father of all men. Not that God is running some sort of a heavenly adoption agency and you have to become a child of God, but that you are already, and this is one important point, I think. But it's so refreshing to hear a non-violent voice, I mean, as someone who isn't advocating hate, kill, and destroy in America. It's most, most welcome voice. How did you manage it, though? Well, I believe this is the only hope. I think if you look it at plan is. planetary history and see that people down through the ages have been living in virulent and vitriolic violence, Primitive that there violence. is the time coming now for, in fact, a spiritual renaissance. And I think that we can live as one family on this planet just because we haven't before, and that whatever people's backgrounds, I mean, sociologically or economically, whether your furniture goes back to Louis XIV or your car goes back to the finance company, the 31st, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you do most of your business with a stockbroker or a pawnbroker, that still you're a child of God, that that's the crucial point about man, that he's infinitely loved if he'd only dare to believe it. I'm still puzzled by your concept of a soul. Uh, you would contend there is something more 
to the human mind than just the, the uh, physical, chemical, uh, electrical processes of the brain in reaction to the body. In yes, I would the say there is. What more is there? And what is your evidence? Well, let me tell a story. <laughs> On one occasion, what? Another. <laughs> <laughs> would you rather tell a story? I'm not sure you could be representing. I'm not representing a denomination. I'm here as an individual. That's very good. Yes. Let me tell a story. On one occasion, an atheist and a man of spiritual faith were arguing. And the atheist was saying, I went to a museum of science, and there on the shelves I saw all the things that compose human beings. I saw so much phosphorus, so much lime, so much potassium, so much water, and so forth. And he said, I did not see a little jar there with the soul on it. So he said, where's your soul? The man of faith said, I refuse to argue with you about this. I refuse to discuss it at all. The atheist said, aha, I have you. The man of faith said, no, but if you think I, as an intelligent, rational person, I'm going to stand here and waste my good time arguing with just so much lime, so much potassium, so much calcium and water, you're crazy. <laughs> Bravo. Very now, what I would say it is, that we, well, I think, what would you say? It doesn't answer the question. Yeah, I would say, in a sense, it does, because the point that this is making is that what you recognize about another person is not just the outward physical nature of a person. But uh, they really, you can't really talk about it. I mean, you can't One of my convictions is that man has within himself all that he needs inherently, innately, to find God, to have this experience. That simply by the faith to dare to believe that man is infinitely valuable, that we're sons and daughters of this God, that we have a fragment of infinity, a spark of divinity within us, by just that alone, man can be transformed from the inside out, like turning a sock inside out almost. Yeah. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. It offers simple, understandable answers to some of the most perplexing questions confronting modern humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? The title of this free booklet, containing transcripts of unrehearsed, spontaneous question and answer sessions on campus, is Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God getting to know God and growing spiritually about the processes of inward discovery and adventure, the new power and purpose potential for every human life. Another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again, Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California. C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus.